this pilgrim then there is a friend who walks with me leads me safely through the sinking sand it is the christ of calvary this would be my prayer dear lord each day to help me do the best i can for i need thy light to guide me day and night blessed jesus hold my dim toward the setting of the sun lead me safely to the land of rest and fire crown of life that I want I have put my faith in thee dear Lord that I may reach the golden strand there's no other friend on whom I can depend blessed Jesus hold my hand Jesus hold my hand me by thy side, hear my feeble plea, O oh Lord, Lord, look down on me, when I kneel in prayer, I hope to meet you there, blessed Jesus, hold my hand, Jesus, hold my hand. Jesus, hold my hand. Yeah. 
you have your Bibles, turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 2. We're going to look at Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 1 through chapter 3, verse 5. What a beautiful song and beautiful thoughts. I'd rather have Jesus more than anything in the whole world. The question is, where we find ourselves today, and we make that kind of a statement, are we being 100% honest with God? Is there anything we would rather have instead of our relationship with Jesus? The title of this is The Unfaithful Bride. What a title for Mother's Day. But this is where God has led us. And the main focus of this passage, though, is that the God who promised never to leave us also promised never to leave us in our sin. And in this passage, Jeremiah, he deals with several different metaphors. One of those is a marriage metaphor where he talks about Israel and Judah and the adultery. And so when we think about we are the bride of Christ, what we need to ask ourselves is this, is have we compromised in places in our life that we no longer have been trusting in Christ, we have no longer been following him, that there have become things that are more important in our life. Like one of the things I hear from everybody is, we want to go back to normal. Well, have you ever thought about maybe God doesn't want us to go back to normal? Maybe we do need a new normal, and that new normal would include you and I on our knees before God in our hearts every single day saying, God, I trust you no matter what. I follow you wherever you lead, wherever you want to go. I want to be faithful. I'm not the husband. He's the husband. We're the bride. We follow where he he leads us. And by the way, sometimes God will lead you into scary places. Trust me. I know. I've been there with him. But you know the great thing about it? is the fact that once you've been there with him and you realize he carries you through it, that you realize, wow, what an amazing thing. I was sharing with my Sunday school class this morning about Vance Kirkpatrick, a dear friend of mine, and he lives in Kenya. Uh, He looked out his window and he sees wildebeest and zebras and giraffes just going. He's got a huge picture window and he sits every morning drinking his coffee and he tells a story, and it's a true story. It's when he took a group to the Congo, and uh, they're there looking at gorillas, and they, the guy had told him, listen, you stay way away from the gorillas. You don't get close. If you see a mother with a baby, you don't even turn your lens over there to take that picture because they, they're very protective of those babies. And he talks about how he would kept getting a little bit further behind, but he could see them, and he got off the path a little bit, and he saw a baby. He thought, I've got to get a picture of this, and he realized I'm between the baby and the mother. And he talks about he knew that you're not supposed to look a gorilla in the eyes because that's, that's challenging them. So he just kind of bent over on his knees, and he was praying to God, and he's looking at the ground, and he says, you could feel the mother's arm reach over him. And he says, and when she went to grab that baby, you could feel his, her breath on the back of your neck as she was snorting. And he says, that heat come down your shoulders, you could feel it. He says, she picked that baby up, and she put it behind her and walked away with it. And he said, you know, uh, i got to admit, I was scared. I was in a dangerous place. That, that gorilla could have killed me easily. They're so much more powerful than, than hum, uh, human is. He said, but you know what? He said, I know what it's like for a gorilla's breath to be on your neck. Most people don't, will never know in this life, what does it feel like for a gorilla to breathe on your neck? He said, that's the way some of you are in your relationship with God. You're so afraid to get close to God that you're going to miss the breath of God on your life. And so that's what I want to talk to you about today is you and I getting so close to God that we actually are, if we're not being the faithful bride, that we will become the faithful bride that God wants us to be. There's three things I think we can learn from this. In chapter 2, the first eight verses, I want you to notice we forget what God has done for us. The very first thing in you and I backing away from our relationship with God, and God's going to deal with us about how used to at one time we used to love him. We used to walk with him, but something's happened and we've kind of fallen back now. We've let some other things get between us. And one of the reasons is because we've forgotten what God has done for us. Look in these first eight verses. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, go and proclaim in the ears of Jerusalem saying, thus says the Lord. I remember concerning the devotion of your youth. In other words, when we first got together, I remember that. I remember how devoted and the love of your betrothals. You're following after me in the wilderness through a land that was not sown. Israel was a holy nation unto me. It was the first of my harvest. All who ate of it became guilty. Evil came upon them, declares the Lord. 
Here is a word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, What injustice did your fathers find in me, that they should be so far away from me, and walk after emptiness? They became empty themselves, and they did not say, Where is the Lord who brought us out of the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness, through the deserts and through the pits and through the land of drought and deep darkness, through a land that no one has crossed and where no man has dwelt. I brought you into a fruitful and a place where fruit is good to eat with good things. But you came and you defiled my land and my inheritance, you made an abomination. The priest even did not say, where is the Lord? And those who handle the law they did not know me. The rulers also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied for Baal, and they walked after things that did not profit them. Notice here he says, go and cry so that Jerusalem may hear. He reminds the core of, of Jeremiah's work is to the, to, the, to the children of Judah in Israel uh, or in Jerusalem, and that's where his primary focus was. And so he's talking to them there. God here offers, often refers to Judah as Israel, and we see that throughout, he switches back and forth, but he's talking, when he's talking to Judah, he's talking about all of Israel. When he's talking about Israel, he's talking about Judah. Notice he says, I remember you. I remember the devotion. Some translations say, I remember your kindness because it was a kind, loving, warm devotion. I remember when we first got together. I remember in your youth, though Jeremiah had a heart for God, he had to, this appeal to Jerusalem, drawing on the memory of the past. We need to remember now that it was about 800 years earlier before Jeremiah that, that Moses gave the word of God and the law of God and people remembered the law of God for a period of time. But here we find ourselves 800 years later and they were not remembering the things of God. Notice he says, when you went after me in the wilderness, this is a reference to the Exodus. Do you remember when I led you all the way through? Remember all those great times we had together. We, we should not forget all the wonderful times that we had when we had a, a good relationship with the Lord. Notice he says, and all that devour them will offend. Disaster will come upon them. I want to remind you that just earlier in chapter 2, uh, one of the things that, that, or chapter 1, one of the things that God had promised Judah was, I will always be with you and I'll always deliver you as long as you are obedient. However, they become disobedient. And so now we find pressure coming from all sides. And the reason being is because they refuse to be obedient. In verses 4 through 8, we see the ingratitude. And that's one of the, the problems is we've got to be honest and ask ourselves the question, are you grateful for what God has done for you? Or do you think God owes you something else? This just says, what injustice have your fathers found in me that they have gone far away from me? God called the house of Israel into account because they rejected him. For what? For idols. You have followed idols and you have become idolaters. They went after what he, God calls worthless and no, things of no value. He says, I brought you into a bountiful country where the fruit is good, where everything is good. And what have you done? You have forgotten me. Now, it's understandable after 800 years, after the exodus, it's understandable that they had forgotten it doesn't make it right. Well, think about our own country. There was a time when this was a true, genuine Christian nation. I heard a Muslim recently say, do you know the difference between Islam and, and, and American Christianity? He says, with Islam, we put God first. With American Christianity, we put God last. Now, if you think about it, and the things that we seem to put into our life that seem to be important to us, I think he may have a valuable point. Because I would say that 21st century Christianity in general has put ourselves first and God last. I'm not saying that Islam is true on the point about Islam putting God first because, of course, if he's talking about Allah, which he would be, then Allah is not the God that we serve. But he's assuming we're talking about the same God. I would say we're not talking about the same God. But you get the point. Are we putting him first rather than ourselves first? He says, and by doing that, he says, you have defiled my land and my inheritance that I had for you. You've made an abomination out of it. God clearly called Israel 
his land and his inheritance. And he says, and what you've done, when I look at you, Israel, when I look at you, Judah, when I look at you, 21st century American church, he says, you, you're an abomination to me. Why? Because you don't trust me anymore. You trust in other people. You trust in wood and you trust in, in, in stone instead of trusting in me. He said, look, even those who handle the law, even the priest, how many preachers today are preaching a false gospel or they're just not preaching a gospel at all? They're just trying to make people feel better about where they are in the world today. That's not what God has called us to do. We are to handle the word of the Lord the way he says to handle it. He said, even the prophets are not even saying, where is the Lord? Isn't it a, now, why would they not be asking, where is the Lord? Because they're comfortable serving other idols. I wonder how far God has to get away from us before we realize, oh, excuse me, where, where, where has he gone? How long before we get on our knees and say, where is the Lord? A lot of people are asking the question today, God, where are you at? Where can you help us? The thing is, they're, they're asking us to help. We're asking God to help with the wrong things. We want God to return our country back to normal. And I would say our country doesn't need to turn back to where it was. Our country needs to turn to God. If those in authority and those, the rest of us would get on our face before God and say, God, where are you? And, and not just deliver me, God, from my circumstance, but God, I want to be close to you. I want to follow after you. And God, if you lead me into another wilderness, it's okay. I will follow. I'm not asking God to get me out of the situation I'm in. And that's what Judah would do. And that's what Israel would do. The only time they would ask God, where are you? Is say, where God, get me out of this mess I'm in. I've trusted in Egypt, I've trusted in Assyria, I've trusted in, in all these idols, I've trusted in Ashtaroth and all these things, but God, where are you now? Get me out of the mess I'm in. God's not interested in getting you out of the mess you're in. God is interested in you getting on your knees and getting close to him. He's interested in his bride being pure and holy. He said, your rulers have transgressed against me. I'm not going to read all these verses from 9 to 37, but in 9 to 37, we find that our satisfaction is in other things. Beginning in verse 9, he says, Therefore, I will yet continue with you, declares the Lord, and with your son, son, I will continue or contend. For the cross the coastlands of Kittim and Sea, and sent to Kadar, and observe closely, and see if all the things that I tell you about has a nation changed her gods so that they were not gods. But my people have changed their glory. For that which does not profit, be appalled, O heavens, at this, and shudder at the very desolation, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils, and you might want to mark these down. Number one, my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. Second, they have hewn out cisterns, broken cisterns, which can hold no water. As we look through Chapter 2, verse 14 through 32, we find that Israel had found satisfaction in things other than their relationship with God. First off, they were happy just being a slave to Assyria and to Egypt. They were happy being the prey of other nations. They'd become so satisfied, Lord, just, just whatever you want to do, that's fine, it'll, it'll happen, just, just get me out of the mess I'm in. According to verse 20, they were happy being a prostitute, chasing after other lovers. And what he means by that is chasing after other gods. They were happy being a wild vine, which is of no use to God. They were happy being a donkey. They were happy being, being a thief until they got caught. He says, you're like a bride who forgot her wedding dress and you're not even concerned about it. Any brides in here forget your wedding dress? That's not something you normally do. But that's what he says here when you get to verse 32. He says, you're like a bride who forgot to even bring her wedding dress to the wedding. Why? Because you didn't care. Look at verse 13, and this is maybe the saddest statement in all of the chapter. <clears throat> he says, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me. What have you forsaken? The fountain of living waters. The second thing you've done is because you weren't happy with the fountain of living water that I gave you, you went and hewed out cisterns for yourself, and they're broken cisterns. They don't even hold water. Verse 13, the word that's rendered well here, the or fountain, it talks about something that's deep that's flowing from inside the earth that comes out of the ground. It comes out as a fountain. It's pure and it's clean. However, the word is here for broken cistern. What he's talking about, that which is worthless, 
that which is putrid, it has no flavor, it's flat, it's lost its flavor. He says, you're trading the, the, the river of life that comes up out of the ground, which is me, you're trading that away for a, to build a cistern that's not, it's broken, it's not even going to hold the water, and all you're doing is getting groundwater, it's putrid. There's a, I won't call names, but if you go up here to the, to the stop sign and take a left, some of those businesses down there, one of the guys that owns one of those businesses was putting a well in, and uh, he only went 15 feet deep. And he got water. He got plenty of water. And the reason being, he's right down there almost on, on the uh, intercoastal. But here's the thing. It's all the swamp water. And when you turn it on, it stinks. You drink it, you're like, oh, no, I'm not getting near that. You don't want to wash a car with it. Must, let's put it in your body. It's, it's, it's water that's not deep. It hadn't been purified. It hadn't went down through all the, 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 the rock and everything to where it's, it's clean and pure and come back up. And God says, I'm giving you clean, pure, life-giving, healthy, tasty water. That's what I provided for you. It's a deep spring, and you've traded it for groundwater. That's really what he's saying here. You're trading it for groundwater. It's flat. It's lost its flavor. It's of no value whatsoever. That's when you went chasing after other gods. That's what you've done. Like we said earlier, is there anything we put in our relationship that's more important than our relationship with God? What is it that you desire? What is it that you want? Israel wanted water, but they didn't want God's water. They were happy and content to, have a, to build a cistern. By the way, we built cisterns ourselves. We as individuals, we as a church, we as a, as, a, as a corporate church in the world today, we have built cisterns ourselves that, because we want water the way we want water. And we've gotten to where we're happy with it. Even though it's not healthy, even though it stinks, we're happy with it. We're content with it. Verse 13, he says there are two evils. He's highly offended at this. Why? Because they, they replace their relationship with God with complacency. And they're content with what they've created. Notice he says, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. Verse 14, he says, also Israel, are you happy being a slave? Or is he a firstborn servant? Why has he become prey? The young lions have roared at him, and he has roared loudly. And they have made his land a waste, and the cities they've destroyed, and without any inhabitants. And the men of Memphis and Thophanes, he says, they have shaved the crown upon your head. In other words, they have killed your king. They've taken your king hostage. He has led you away. But now... What are you doing on the road to Egypt to drink the waters of the Nile? God is saying, seriously, you're going to go drink the waters of the Nile rather than what? In other words, you're going to follow after their gods? You're going to follow after the gods of Assyria rather than following after me? <coughs> Verse 23, he says, how can we say this then? I am not defiled. How can you say that you've not gone after other gods and after Baals? And the reason being, he says, you're like a donkey. In fact, you're like a donkey in heat. I know that doesn't sound very popular. That's what he calls them. Amazing how God looks at those who run after other things. He accuses them of being a wild vine of no value at all. Notice he says, Israel, you're a servant. Are you happy being a home-born slave? How are, you allow, are you happy allowing other people like the Assyrians in Egypt to come and plunder you? He says, the people of Memphis and Thophanes have broken the, head of your, the crown of your head. He's talking about they've killed your king. They've taken King Josiah into battle. And we know that from Kings chapter 23, verse 29, 2 Kings. No matter how appalling the prospect may be of going after other gods, Judah was happy doing it. Israel was happy doing it. They had become entangled with the other gods. And I think the thing we have to ask ourselves is, is we need to honestly look in our heart and say, God, have I left you somewhere and have I now become worshiping other gods? Well, it can be money. It can be a person. It can be things. Am I happy? <clears throat> Notice you said your own wickedness will correct you. Your backslidings will rebuke you. If Jerusalem did continue in this destructive behavior, God was going to let them destroy themselves. Notice he says, the fear of me is not in you, says the Lord of hosts. Now, they were afraid of the Assyrians, and they were afraid of the Egyptians, and so they're trying to appease them. They're, they're trying to get more and more into their culture so they can blend in better because they were afraid of them. And God says, seriously, you're afraid of Assyria? You're afraid of Egypt, but you're not afraid of me? 
That's what he's saying here. The fear of me is not in you, says the Lord of hosts. Jerusalem feared the attack of the Babylonians, but they didn't fear God. I'm afraid that's where we are today. There are so many people living in fear of so many things, and we're in fear of those things, and God says, and you don't have reverence for me? You don't have a holy, healthy fear for me instead? You fear all these other things? I want to remind you, it's God who gives life and takes life. It's not other things. You said, I will not transgress. But look, on every high hill under every green tree, you've laid down playing the part of a harlot. And of course, we know he's using symbolism here. But what is he saying? He said, you trade your relationship with me. And then the next part is really telling. Notice he says, you played the part of a harlot. You become the degenerate plant of an alien vine. And though you wash yourself with lye, you don't come clean. What is, he, what is he telling them there? He's telling them, let me tell you what's happening. You have sinned against me. You know you've sinned against me. You're trying. And by the way, washing with lye, anybody know about how, how caustic lye soap is? Not very many of you are going to get in the bathtub tonight and, put, and, and wash yourself down with lye soap. Here's what he's saying. You're trying to clean yourself up. You can't clean yourself up. You can't clean your sins away. Only God can clean our sins away. He says, wash with all the lie soap you want, but don't you know that you're still an abomination to me. Until you get on your knees and repent and ask for forgiveness and restore that relationship, he says, you're going to be dirty. You don't have the power. I don't have the power to wash my sins away. Only the blood of Christ and the relationship that we have with him. That's the thing that's the value. He says, you don't even see your way in the valley to know what you have done. You don't even realize all the sacrifices that you've made to wood and stone. And then later he's going to say, and, well, what I hear, saying there's a tree, you're my father. Boy, that Jeremiah here, I'm trying to figure out, Jeremiah, are you actually saying this tongue in cheek? Are you being a little humorous with them? Or are you really just trying to drive the point home? Because here's what he's saying. You say to a tree, you're my father. You say to a stone, you're my father. He said, they're not your father. Notice what he's saying here. He says, this is foolishness. You are worshiping foolishness. You should be worshiping. By the way, he's talking about Baal, and he's talking about Ashtoreth. When he's talking about stone and, and wood because that's all the Canaanite deities were wood and stone. He said, but in a time of trouble, you say, arise and save us. He says, and I'll say back to you, where are your gods? I wonder if that's what God is saying to us today. Because, see, Judah did repent, but she didn't repent the way she was supposed to. What she was saying is, God, where are you? Get me out of the mess I'm in. Not, God, forgive me for the sinner that I am. God, forgive me for worshiping Baal. God, forgive me for worshiping Asher. God, I want that relationship restored. They just want to get out of the trouble that they found themselves. And I can't tell you how many people I've talked to in the last two months, they want out of the trouble that we find ourselves in. I don't know how long we're going to have to go through this trouble, but God does. But I'll tell you what's the most important thing. The most important thing is our relationship with him. And as the bride of Christ, we don't worship anybody but him. So today people are asking, where is your gods? And he brings in about the, the wedding dress. I don't think I've ever met a bride that did not bring her dress to the wedding. In fact, most brides make sure it's there before the day of the wedding. They want to make sure we got the flowers done, we've got the cake done, but boy, I, that dress, and who knows how many times she's tried it on. I mean, she's ready for the wedding. And God says, and then you show up like a bride without her dress. In other words, I don't mean that much to you. Well, I'll just get married in my blue jeans and tennis shoes. But you're supposed to have a dress. The third thing is God will not leave us alone. Now, this we're going to have to pay real close attention to these five verses because there's a, there's a lot in here that if we don't pay close attention to, we'll miss it. I'm thankful that even though Judah and Israel sinned against God, they played the part of a harlot, they, were, they lived their life foolishly, they rejected God's living water, God is still a forgiving God, and God did not leave them alone which means even though you and I may have strayed from our relationship with God, God has not left us alone. Look in verse 1. God says, if a husband divorces a wife and she goes from him and then belongs to another man, will he return to her? Will not that land be completely polluted? But you are a harlot with many lovers, yet you return to me, declares the Lord. Lift up your eyes 
to the bare heights and sea where you have not been violated by the roads where you have set like an Arab in the desert. In other words, you're ready just to pounce and steal. You have polluted the land with your harlotry and with your wickedness. Therefore, the showers which have been withheld, and there has been no spring rain, yet you've had a harlot's forehead, you refuse to be ashamed, and you have not yet called out to me, my father. You are a friend of my youth. Will he be angry forever? Will he be indignant until the end? Behold, you have spoken and have all these evil things you have done and you have had your way. You say, preacher, where is forgiveness in there? I want you to notice this here. He says, if a man divorces his wife and then she returns to him after being another, he's quoting Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4 here. And that's what he's, that's what he's focusing on is, is, is God said, you can't do that. It's, a, it's, a, it's unlawful to be polluted. Moses understood it. Those after Moses understood it. But what it boiled down to is they were, they were just, oh, yeah, you can have her. I'll, I'll find me another one. They were not taking marriage serious. And so then sometimes she would come back and he would take her back. And God says, that's not proper. It's not, you can't do those kinds of things. You're not taking marriage seriously. He says, but yet you return to me. Now notice this. Listen to this. Pay close attention. Yet you return to me, says the Lord. Now, there's a bit of mystery here, and translators see it differently. For example, the New King James and the New International Version translate that, that uh, it's an invitation from God for you to return to me. Others, like the NASB and ESV, translate it as an accusation, God accusing Israel of wanting to return, but for wanting to return to the wrong, for the wrong reason. The NASB says, but you are a harlot with many lovers, yet you return to me. ESV says, would you return to me? Why is all this important? Here's what it boils down to. The verb sal that is there, the word, the word return, is a, is a word that can be used in a lot of different cases. But context always dictates how it's used. Is this God pointing his finger at them and saying, listen, this is what you have done? Because that's what he's been doing for the first part of the chapter. But in chapter 3 here, I find something interesting. If you look at the whole chapter... And we'll look at that next week, the rest of chapter 3 and chapter 4. Uh, <clears throat> and it's not about a bride, thank goodness, because last week we had that, now this week. But here's what he's saying in there. All of, chapter, all of chapter 3 is about God forgiving and God restoring and God offering an invitation to come back. If you take it in the context of chapter 3, it is not God condemning for doing that. God has already condemned them all the way through chapter 2 into chapter 3. What this is, is this is an invitation. Here's what it boils down to. God is reminding them, let me tell you, even amongst yourselves, I will not permit you to marry, get divorced, remarry, and then go back to your first husband. That is not the way that you're supposed to do it. That, God says, I look at that and it's unholy because you're not taking marriage serious. He says, however, I want to tell you something. Let me tell you how I'm different. I will forgive you. And even though you've went after many gods and you've let a lot of things come into your life and, and, and uh, uh, draw you away from me, I'm willing to take you back. It's consistent with all of chapter 3. So what we see here is God will not, and Israel's asking, God, will you always be angry? Will you always be uh, infuriated with me? And here's where God turns it and says no. What he's saying, this is an invitation. You have played the part of a harlot, but guess what? My ways are above your ways. And I expect you to live the way I've told you to live, but I will take you back. And for those who have wandered a long ways from God, who've committed a lot of sins, should be very, very happy that God is still not angry. God is inviting you to come back. He's invited you to put your faith and trust in him. Notice he says there are some, some things that have taken place, the showers, uh, the early rains and the, the latter rains, they didn't come. Why? Because of the fact that Israel has sinned. Uh, I want to close with this. And I think this is the, the, the focal part of the whole message, the idea with cisterns. And I think this is where we find ourselves. A lot of people, when they become a believer, and we don't see a lot of growth in their life, and you ask, why is that? I think about, y'all know we came from North Georgia and the Chattahoochee River, there are places that I can step across it. Right at the head where it starts, I can walk right across it. Further down, I can jump across it. Get further, it gets deeper and wider and I can swim across it. 
By the time it leaves Atlanta, it's a huge raging river. So what's the difference? Is it grows and it grows and it grows. And that's what we're supposed to do in our relationship with God. It comes out of a source. It's a healthy source and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's what we're supposed to do. When you and I put our faith and trust in Christ, we're supposed to grow in that. The reason that our growth is done is because we've got cisterns that we have made. They're trying to carry water, but they're broken cisterns. And by the way, a cistern by, by nature isn't designed to carry a lot of water. It only carries a certain amount of water which means you're never going to grow. You're never going to grow as long as you are, are choosing what to drink from. And I think the whole thing here, what God is saying to them and saying to us, is even though you've done all these things, you've committed all these atrocities, he says one of the worst things that you've done that I really hold against you is I gave you life-giving, beautiful, wonderful water that's tasty, that is beneficial to you, that is healthy, and you've traded it for putrid Water that has no taste, water that is not good for you. Well, we need to be more like the Chattahoochee where we drink from the well. Our vision of us with Jesus, it starts small, but it gets deeper and deeper and deeper in our relationship. What kind of cisterns have we created? Well, there's all kinds of cisterns. It can be a cistern of relationship. It can be a, just a strong will. People, there are some people who are just rebellious against God. We need to take advantage of good biblical instruction. If we take good biblical instruction, we can, we can tear down those cisterns. And it's time we tear them down. The question is, when, for example, when we come to Sunday school, we come to church, do we just go home and forget about it? If we come to Wednesday night Bible study, do we just go home and forget about it? Or are we, are we day by day applying the things that we are learning to our lives? We need to tear down the cisterns. And one of the ways to do that is take advantage of good biblical instruction. Next, we, as a church, we need to evaluate our ministries. What are we doing? What are we doing here? We need to make sure that we haven't veered off away from God. We need to know exactly where God wants us to go, and we need to go in God's direction. Maybe we built some cisterns we need to tear down so we can drink from his well. We need to seek authentic worship. We were talking about that Wednesday night, and I don't know, somebody, could have been me, mentioned something about, we need to be free to worship. I asked a question. I said, how many of you guys have ever been in a worship service where you just felt like you're really compelled by God just to lift your hands up, and you felt like, well, I don't have the freedom to do that because they don't do that here, or if, they, if I do do that, I'm not comfortable because somebody might think I'm charismatic. There's several hands got raised, and so somehow from there, we went to Becky running laps around the, the, the church. And I'm not for that either, unless God tells her to do it. And if God tells her to do it, she better do it. What am I talking about? I'm talking about we need to have an authentic atmosphere of worship where however God moves you, you respond to God. Now, by the way, if it draws attention to you, it's you. If it draws attention to him, it's him. I've heard people shout before in church, more than just amen. You know, a good thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank your holy name, you know. And you could tell it was real, it was genuine, it was sincere. God moved that individual just to give a testimony of how God is so good in their life. I've also seen people that by the time it's over, you know, it's about them. But we need to have authentic worship. And by the way, what, what's authentic worship start with? You prepare your heart and you prepare your mind. Your heart and your mind should be prepared before you ever come in the door. You should have had a good prayer time this morning just between you and Jesus. Say, God, today you've got something for me at church, and today I want you to speak to me. God, I expect you to speak to me today. And when you walk through the door, your heart and your mind are prepared so that God can, can minister to you. We need to stop chasing our plans and chase after God's heart. We need to ask God what his plan is. We need to stop living worldly lives and truly commit our lives to Christ. There's, there's a lot of people that, that play games with God. They go to church. They've never been saved. Don't really care about being saved. Or maybe sometimes they think they are saved. But they've never been to a place where they've met Jesus face to face and said, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I repent of my sin because you're right. I've been running from you, and I need to repent of my sin and put my faith and trust in you. And if you've never done that really seriously, genuinely, you need to do that. We need to stop living worldly lives and commit our lives to the bridegroom. And we need to stop being satisfied and being happy with empty, broken cisterns. What does it really boil down to? We need to learn to trust him. This was a hard, hard message for you to hear. 
How hard do you think it was for me to hear when God, because by the way, you know the old story about one point at you, four pointing back at me? You realize every Sunday before I deliver this, I have to deal with it myself? I have to ask God, God, what about me? God, are there cisterns in my life that, that I've just ignored, I've overlooked? God, are, are there areas in my life where I'm not trusting you? Am I drinking from this putrid water or am I still drinking from the living well? What am I drinking from? I have to examine my own heart. And today I want to challenge you. God had us in this passage for a reason. I think God wants every single one of us to examine our own heart and ask that question, God, am I being a faithful bride to you? God, have I, am I still drinking from that water, that fresh water that'll, that'll carry you all the way down where God wants you to go? Which, by the way, like I said earlier, sometimes God will get you in a mess. Can I just be honest with you? He will. If you tell people you get saved and everything's going to be hunky-dory, life's going to be great, you're lying to them. God will get you in a mess so that he can prove himself strong to get you out of it. God has got me in a lot of messes, and he's never, ever, ever forsaken me. Every single time, he's always delivered me. Several years ago, I did a, a message on Isaiah and eagles. He's a mount up with wings of eagles, and I thought about that in conjunction with this passage. And, you know, the eagle, when... When they get in trouble, I don't know if you've ever seen, if you're, somebody starts shooting at an eagle, they find the sun, they find out where the shooter's at, and they'll get right in the sun, between the sun and the shooter and head toward the sun. And the reason being, it blinds the shooter, and he's got a lot less chance of hitting the eagle if you can't see him because you're blinded by the sun. And I think that's what God's saying to us. We need to be heading straight to the sun. Why? Because it'll blind everything else that's trying to chase us. We need, to, we need to ask ourselves the question, am I living in a broken cistern? If you are living in a broken cistern, it's time to get out of that cistern. It's time to get in a fountain of living water. If, if, you have been, if you've had other things that are more important to you than your relationship to Jesus Christ, it's a God to you. Whether it's a thing or a person or money or whatever it might be, anything that's more important than you're worshiping it, 